and I'm going to talk this morning about changing the world. I want to change the world. I want to change the world. Garrett, you want to change the world? How do you say your last name? Michael Boom? I got it the first time. That's how it works. See? Tim Carney said this morning, he said, I'm not anointed to play the guitar. I'm anointed and. And what I just found out is I'm anointed and I can say your last name. But I'm going to change the world. In the parts that I haven't changed already, I'm going to work on changing as I move forward. Because I want to change the world. I want to make a difference. Now the world to me isn't this great big blue ball that just kind of hangs in space. The world to me is the circumference in which I live my life. I live it. My circumference might be a little different than yours. My little area might be smaller than some, might be bigger than others. I've never been to Africa, but I've been to the Solomon Islands. So that was my world at that time. I've never been back. I went over there. My wife and I with Cynthia Rollins was incredible. But my biggest world, the biggest world I know, is the one within about 20 miles of right here. That's the biggest world I know. And you know what? In that 20 miles of right here, there are numerous. In fact, I could not count how many people there are in this little 20-mile circle that need God. I have no idea. What I do know is, driving here this morning, driving out of my neighborhood, I can look on the sidewalk and I see people walking their dogs. I see people walking across the street, riding their bikes. Coming in, I see people pulling into the stores along the way. And I think, well, they need God. Or they need God. Or at least need a reason to show up somewhere this morning and learn something more about God if they have God. They've lost confidence in what God can do among a congregation of people. So my heart and soul is to change the world. And you know what my response is going to be? When, when God says to me, Steve, are you willing to change the world? You know what my response is going to be? I hope it's the same as yours. I will. I will. If God says to you, will you change the world? What's your response? Well, it might be true among us in this room. But among many that are outside of this room, and probably even some that are in this room, there's some that would say, I won't, for numerous reasons. Just because people are sitting within the walls of a church does not mean that they're passionate about what God wants to do in the earth. Oftentimes people sit within the walls of a church, and I don't know that that's anybody in this room. I don't know that it is not. What I do know is oftentimes people will sit within the walls of a church and they sit there for a few reasons that are common among many. One of them is my husband or my wife tell me that I must go. My mom and my dad, they make me go. For this reason or that reason, I'm there. Because maybe, maybe that's the way I was raised and just believed that it was the right thing to do, to go to church. To be present among the congregation, a congregation of believers to me isn't the right thing to do. It's the only thing to do. It's the only thing to do to allow myself to begin to grow up, to begin to draw upon the one that's sitting to my right or sitting to my left. It's the only thing I know to do to be able to draw out of the anointings that are present in all of you in this room right now. As I stood here this morning and I lifted my voice and I lifted my hands and I sang the songs that we were singing that were on the board, on the wall, on the screen, whatever you want to call that. As we sang the songs that were planted across that and I lifted up my voice with all of you, I was making a draw. I was hearing the sounds that were coming from my right and my left, from behind and in front, and I was listening to those sounds, and those sounds were building me up. Even though we were saying to Him, all praise, all glory to you, it was building me up because what it did to me was say to me, you know what, there's a lot of people in here with a lot of I will. There's a lot of people in here that are saying I will. You want me to lift my hands? I will. You want me to lift my voice? I will. You want me to praise you? I will. Why will I? Because you asked me to. Because it's in me to do. And you know what, man? It builds me up. You're not praising me and you're not worshiping me. But man, you're building me up. Man, you're making me grow. And I can tell you what the Father wants from you and me is He wants us to, in every way, to change the world. I'm going to talk about three kinds of people today in Scripture that have said I will in times past. 
And I think, at least from my perspective, I think, and, and believe me, I, sometimes like Paul, I will say, you know, this isn't necessarily the word of the Lord, but this is what I believe. Paul said it twice. If he said it twice, I can at least say it once. But he said, this isn't necessarily the word of the Lord, but this is really what I believe in my heart. And I believe that most people will fall within one of these three types of people that we're going to talk about this morning. And the three types of people we're going to talk about will be found from persecutor to follower, reluctant but willing, or full of faith and abandon. One of those three types of people, from persecutor to follower, or reluctant but willing, or full of faith and abandon. You can follow along this morning if you want to in the app. It's in there if you follow along and take note the information, the things that I'm sharing today. Most of it you will find right there. So let's talk about the first kind of person. Sometimes among us, and I have an interesting story that I want to share. I can't share too many details, but I'll share a little bit. But sometimes around us and among us, there are people who are determined to deny Christ. Saul of Tarsus was one of those. We all know people that are like that. You know, I remember back when, when my wife and I, um, I started to say when my wife and I were pregnant, I was never pregnant. <laughs> she was. But um, in that process of time, there was a gentleman, a doctor that she had. I can't remember his name today, but Dr. Dwyer. And it was her gynecologist, and, or OBG, I don't know, is it all the same thing? She, it was, it, it, who, I, I'm a man, I'm a man. Forgiveness, please. And um, I've never been to one. I've never been to one. I've never made an appointment with one. I, you know, not... You're there? All right. Okay, now I can't tell my story. You're supposed to be, I'm supposed to have your full undivided attention. Now you're laughing and the mood has totally changed. I just destroyed the, no, I'm just kidding. But we had this doctor, she had this doctor, and I would go with her every time that she went, and she would go in there and she would see him and, and talk and what have you, and, and he would, you know, do what, <laughs> I'm just trying, I don't know, I don't know how to, hey, stop. And I would stand in the office and I would just be there, and he would ask questions every now and then. He would just say something about God or whatever, not much, and, and then we would leave and it wouldn't be much to it. And, and then he let us know at some point along the way, you know, that he just really, because of past experiences, he just decided that there was no God. There was no reason for him to believe in God because of past experience, which is true of so many people. There's so many people around us and among us that have had experiences in their life where because some man or some woman or some church or some denomination or some religion or some, somebody who said they loved God let them down so harshly and deeply that it impacted their ability to even believe in God. And this was him. And he just could not believe and, and found it difficult. Yet he would always ask questions. And, and then as time passed, we had a situation that occurred in our life. And, and um, I was, we were preaching out of town and up, in, uh, up north somewhere. And uh, we were preaching. I was preaching a revival at a church. And I got a call one night after the revival meeting was over. And, and it was this woman on the other end of the phone. I didn't know who she was. She just said, uh, Pastor Parker. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she told me who she was. And... and uh, she said, I, uh, something tragic has happened. And I said, well, what's happened? And she said, my husband was riding his bike. He was an avid biker. He was riding his bike, and he was riding down the side of the road, and he was hit by a truck, and he was killed today. And she said, I would like for you to do his funeral. And um, I'd never done a funeral at that point. I was young in ministry, never done a funeral, didn't even know how to do a funeral. And I said, ma'am, I don't know who, who is this. And she told me her name, and she said, my husband's name's John Dwyer. And man, immediately, I mean, my heart sank. My wife's heart sank. And, and I said, you know what, I'm, right now, I'm, I don't remember where we were, Michigan, I think. And um, I'm in Michigan, and I don't know that I can make it. She said, sir, she said, let me tell you why I'm asking you. My husband did not believe in God. He did not believe there was a God. But every time you and your wife would show up in his office, when you would leave and he came home that night, I always knew when you were there. Because he would come home and he would say, man, I'm telling you what, if I were going to believe in God, it would be Stephen Kim Parker's God. And it was every time. And she said, even though he didn't believe in God, I'm telling you, if he was going to believe in God and if there is a God that can do anything, it's your God. Would you please do the service? And I said, I absolutely will. First service I ever did, first funeral that I ever did, and I went there. 
It was probably the most bizarre thing I've ever been in because he was a very well-known doctor, very popular. Um, I get there, I arrive at the funeral home, and when I get there, all three local television stations at the time, uh, what were local stations at the time, were there, uh, and they were televising this. I had no idea. It was ABC, NBC, and CBS were televising the funeral. It was packed. There was standing room only. There were people standing outside the funeral home. I immediately, my heart sank. I went into a, a meltdown. <laughs> Thank you! And... Um, and Kim's with me, obviously, and, and uh, I f- literally flew in that morning to do the service and had to fly back up to Michigan, and, and I go in there, and I walk in, and I go back, and I'm meeting with a wife and, and his family, and, and, and I'm just seeing what's all around me. I mean, there are drug addicts, there are doctors, there are lo- there is every spectrum of person you can imagine was in that, packed out in that, it was bizarre, the people, the different categories of people that were in that room and and I'm looking out and I'm in a near panic and I'm just saying you know Yahweh I've never done this before I've never done a funeral I don't know what to say to this guy because first of all he didn't believe in you I don't know if he got saved I don't know if he received Christ and I can't commit his soul and his spirit to you if if he's not with you how do I do that and and something Holy Spirit said to me that I've used so many times since, he said, what I want you to do is I want you at the end of this message, I want you to look at his body sitting, lying in that casket, and I want you to say to him in front of that, con- that group of people that are gathered there today, and I want you to say to them, Father, I commit his soul to the place that you have prepared for him. And then it was up to God. It wasn't up to me. And I've used that same statement so many times since. If, I, if, you ever hear, if you're ever at a funeral I'm at, <laughs> and I'm doing... And I say that, it's because I'm really not sure where that guy went. Now you know. So if you're thinking back right now and you heard that at some funeral you were at, you just know, I don't know. I didn't see the fruit. But maybe God did. Long story short, we get out of there and this guy, I'm telling you what, this guy was a a persecutor. But like Saul, he was one that didn't find anything of life or value in any believer that he, at least that we know of, he had met until he met us. It doesn't make us special. It doesn't make us any different than anyone else. It just means we were real enough in his presence that he saw God. We didn't cram Bibles down his throat. In fact, I never offered him one. I, don't, I never offered him a Bible scripture, never offered to pray with him. The, the only time I ever prayed around that guy was when he was lying in a casket. casket. It's the only time I ever prayed around him. In the end of that sermon... Some dude walks in in the back of the thing. I, I dismissed and said amen. Some guy walks in the back of the funeral home singing out drunk as a skunk saying, Puff the magic dragon. It's a true story. And I'm standing behind the pulpit in front of hundreds of people and I'm looking out there. <laughs> Father, do you have a word for this? And I just turned to the funeral director and I said, you got it from here. (laughs) And I stepped aside and let them do whatever they did. But what I know is, it doesn't matter how out there someone is, and you might be the person I'm talking to this morning, it doesn't matter how hard you tried not to believe. What you cannot deny is when someone gets in front of you that really is passionate about God, not passionate about religion, not passionate about the last three Bible verses they memorized, not passionate about denomination, being a Baptist or a Pentecostal or a Methodist, but passionate about being a child of God. When you meet someone like that, it'll change your life forever. You'll never look back. It'll cause you to open your eyes and see things you never thought you'd you'd see. Even this week, again, the second time my wife said to me this week, we had an experience with a physician. I did, had an experience with a physician, almost the exact same thing, almost a mirror image. And I was talking, I will say very little about this because he may be here at any time. But he just asked me about the church and he asked me about us. He asked me if I was still preaching, if I was still a pastor. This guy has let me know in the past he does not have any relationship with God, does not not sure that he believes in God. And this I've known him. He's been my doctor for years, a long time. And 
Long story short, I'm trying to, I don't want to say too much, but when I was leaving there, he said, what time's your service on Sunday? In fact, he said to me, he said, it would, would it be strange to you if you looked out and you saw me, your doctor, sitting in the congregation? I said, would it be strange to you as my doctor if you looked up and you saw me, your patient, preaching? He said, I might be there with my family Sunday. I'm not, I don't see him here. But my wife said, after I got home and I told her that story, she said, I don't know what it is, but somehow Yahweh has anointed you in such a way that people see him in you. And I can tell you that the truth is Yahweh has anointed you in such a way that people should see him in you. In the way you talk, the way you carry yourself. I mean, people laugh. And, and I'm not saying that there is, there is no uh, recipe for uh, Christianity. There's no recipe for being a son that people, or a son of God that people want to um, be like or be around. There's no recipe for that other than obedience. And that's not even a recipe, it's just obedience. Last week, I taught the entire time. I let Deuteronomy 28 do its own teaching. If you will obey the voice of the Lord your God, then these are the things that you can expect. If you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, then these are the things that you can expect. I spent the entire time reading all those verses in Deuteronomy 28, let it do its own teaching. And I say to you today, the same is true. It's about obedience. It's not a recipe. And I want to tell you it's in you. Say it with me. Say it's in me. So when God calls you and God speaks to you and and He draws out of you, and he, he puts something in you. He asks some things of you. Or He requires some things of you. We have two responses. I will, or I won't. I will, or I won't. I will be a son, or I won't. There isn't, I'm going to be sort of like one. I'm going to get real close. I will or I won't. And what determines whether or not we're sons and daughters of God isn't because we go to the right church or we, we, we read the right scripture or we say the right prayer. What determines whether or not we're son or daughter of God is whether or not when He speaks, we say, I will. He said, this is what I would like for you to do. And we say, I will. I will. Can somebody in this room say, I will? So sometimes there are those of us who are determined in every single, in every possible way we're going to deny Christ because of whatever reason that might exist in us. And Saul of Tarsus was one of those, and I want to read in Acts 9. This is the longest scripture part that I'm going to read today, but I do want to read all of this. Acts 9, 1 through 18 says this. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way or belonging to Christ, men or women... He might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Man, I'm going to tell you, what a, what a crazy thing to have, to have that mentality. Man, if I find anybody that's serving Christ, they're doing it different than I think they should. Man, I want to bind them up and I want to throw their hiney in prison. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, what is your problem? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus Christ whom you are persecuting. Get up and enter the city and you will be told exactly what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, uh, mouth wide open, hearing the voice but seeing no one. So Saul rose from the ground and although his eyes were open, he still saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. Man, oh man. I will. Steve Parker, yes, Lord. Man, when you speak, I want to know it. You speak to me in any form. And I'm going to recognize whatever form you speak to me, I'm going to recognize that. I'm going to, I'm going to say, I will. Yes, Lord. 
Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, I want you to get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, I want you to look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he's praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias. He's seen you, Ananias. Come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Lord, I've heard about this man. Have you not? How much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Ananias, you go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. I will. He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. I'm, I need you, Ananias, to take the scales off his eyes because I want him to know how much pain he's going to endure. So Ananias departed, he entered the house, and laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, what I love about this is he didn't get in there and he didn't say, he didn't say, hey dude, hey persecutor of believers, hey you rascal who yesterday, just three days ago, was a nightmare to the rest of us. When the father said, Saul, uh, Ananias, I need you to do something, he said, I will. And immediately, when the father said, do it, Ananias said, I will. Suddenly, his attitude towards this guy who was transformed suddenly changed. Now, brother Saul, hey, brother Saul, you were a rascal a few days ago, but today you're my brother. A few days ago, you were my enemy. Today, you're my brother. It didn't take a long learning process. Now, you're my brother. Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and then be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and he was baptized. See, Saul represents those of us who don't believe, choose not to believe, or choose to avoid the obvious. Someone who likes to be in control of their own lives, someone who finds it easy to downplay the faith of others. Saul represents those of us who, who have had whatever experience in the past. Whatever, we've come up with whatever reason we need to not believe in God. Why do I need God? I have plenty of money. Why do I need God? I have a wonderful family. Why do I need God? I've been successful in every area of my life. Why do I need God? I have perfect health. Why do I need God? Man, I've, I've got friends everywhere. Why do I need God? I don't need God. What do I need God for? Well, I'm going to tell you what you need God for. You need God for the same reason Saul needed God. You need God because without God, without Christ, without Jesus Christ, I want to tell you what you have today. You might have all the money, and you might have all the friends. You may have all the success, but what you don't have is eternal life. What you don't have is an opportunity to know what it is to have success in the kingdom of God. And success in the kingdom of God in every way casts a long shadow on anything you may ever accomplish outside of the kingdom of God. So Saul, in every way, he went from persecutor to follower. And I want to tell you, what did Saul do? Saul, because he said, I will. Even though his first part wasn't, I will. Who are you, Lord? What do you want with me? I can't receive you. Don't you understand? I'm a very educated man, and I very much, I very well know that Jesus Christ can't be the Messiah. Well... What's going to happen here is I'm going to make you blind until you come to the understanding and you see. You won't see anything else until you see Christ in His glory. Anybody hearing me today? So Saul, in so many ways, represents so many people that are in the walls of the church today, outside the walls of the church. They're walking down the sidewalks, riding their bikes. They're wherever they want to be today except for inside the house of God, among a congregation of people who can build one another up. They're anywhere they can be so that they can avoid the things of God. Why? Because in every sense of the word, something has happened in their life that has caused them to say, I won't believe, I won't believe, I won't believe. But man, when that person who says, I won't, I won't, I won't, finally says, I will, I want to tell you, God will do something miraculous in their life. He will change them. And you know what he does after that? Paul did, he had a lot to do with you and me sitting in this room right now. 
What about the person who's reluctant but willing? Let's look at Exodus chapter 3, verses 10 through 12 says this. says, but Moses said, no, Lord, don't send me. I like you. You're good. You're a good God. You're a faithful God. But good Lord, there's got to be somebody better than me. I've never been a good speaker, and I haven't become one since you began to speak to me. I'm a poor speaker. I'm slow. I'm hesitant. I'm nervous. I'm bashful. I'm always afraid I'm going to say the wrong thing. Listen, I can tell you, I put the wrong Bible names in the wrong story so many times in my preaching <laughs> career, life, ministry. I've had the wrong people sitting in the tree. I've had the wrong guy healing the guy at the gate. It's never about the name of the person doing the miracle. It's about the miracle. And that's where I find my peace. Just get the miracle right. If you don't get anything else right, get the miracle right. He said, I'm a poor speaker. I'm slow and hesitant. And the Lord said to him, who gives man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or dumb? Who gives him his sight or makes him blind? It is I, the Lord. Now Moses, go. I'll help you speak and I will tell you what to say. So while reluctant, Moses ultimately said, I will. Even though he needed Aaron as a mouthpiece, he was reluctant. But he was willing. And what little bit of the world did Moses change? Because he said, I will. What little part of where we are today did Moses have in all of that? How many lives were changed? Nations exist today because there was a man, though reluctant, he was shy, he was bashful, he, he stuttered, whatever it was he did, all the things that he thought would hinder me. I'm telling you, in this room, there are people that think, I, I can't. I hear God say, do this, do this, do this. And all I can think of is all the reasons why I can't. And the father saying, yes, you can. And just because you think you can't is not going to keep me from continuing to say, do this. He said, because I'm not asking for your perfect speech. I'm not asking for your high level of education. I'm not asking for 10,000 experiences that you've had so you can walk somebody through the same thing. All I'm asking for is your obedience. And if you will say, I will, you have no idea how I will use you to change your world. And then there are those that fall into the category full of faith and abandon. And I could put in their parentheses, kind of stupid. I know, I'm sorry for the kids that are in here. Kind of uh, something else. Full of faith and abandon. The kind of people that say, man, I heard God and bless God, I'm on it. God called me to preach. I've known him all of five minutes. And man, I'm going to use that five minutes of knowledge and I'm going to spread it out over one hour of talking. <laughs> Full of faith and abandon. You know, um, let me read it. Mark 1, 16 through 18. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, he said, hey, come and follow me. Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people at once. They left their nets and followed him. They said, I will. At once, they said, oh, get off this boat. I, I'm telling you, I would have seen him coming and I would have gotten off the boat because I get seasick. <laughs> so if I'd have seen that opportunity, he would, I, I wouldn't have waited for him to ask. But they got off that boat. They said, I will. I will. I mean, they're literally, they're full of faith and abandon. They're just like, they're, they're all in. These people don't know. Maybe they heard. Maybe they heard a little bit about Christ. We don't know. We don't know what they knew about him at that time. All we know is when he was present. And he made a request. In fact, he didn't make a request. He said, I'm going to make you fishermen of something different. Follow me. It wasn't a request. He said, follow me. And I believe if they'd have stood there and they would have thought, well, what are we going to do? You know, Simon, what are we going to do? I don't know, Andrew. What do you want to do? I don't know. Should we talk to Dad? I don't know. I think Jesus would have kept saying, follow me. Follow me. 
And they said, I will. And, and full of faith and abandon, they, they got right out of that boat. And they went and they followed him. And, and I don't know, but I think they did a little bit to change the world, don't you? I don't know, but I think Peter had a lot to do with what we know about the gospel of Jesus Christ today. I think Peter had a lot to do with what we know about living by the Spirit. Full of faith and abandoning, going out there and saying, Father, I will. Now, I can tell you in the middle of all of that, it shouldn't be foolishness. But when we know God calls us, there are those of us under the sound of my voice today, when he calls, you're not afraid at all. You have no fear. You jump right in. You're excited about the opportunity. You know what? I, I always tell people this. I'm careful. Because there's no experience that someone else has that anyone else needs to duplicate if it isn't the word of the Lord to them. The very first night I met my wife, I cannot tell you how many people have tried to meet their wife the way I met mine. Because it's an incredible story, but it's a story of faith. The very first night I met her, What's your name? My name's Kim. My name's Steve. You're going to marry me. You're going to be my wife. I'm not. I'm seeing somebody. And I said, that'll change. <laughs> it's a true story. And I've told that story. And since I've told that story, I can't even tell you how many people have come and said, you know what? I believe I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> and I've never seen it happen for anybody else like it happened to my wife and I. We've been married 30, almost 31 years. We have three children, grandbaby, another grandbaby on the way. I'm telling you what, when God's in, when you say, I will... And you're saying it to the right voice. Not the voice of passion, but the voice of the Lord. Not the voice, voice of I want this, but the voice of the Lord. Full of faith and abandon, there's this spirit. Simon and Andrew represent those of us who jump. We don't even think about it. We just jump in. We don't even think. They believed and they abandoned all to follow the unknown. Each of these people, even with their peculiar ways, every single one of them, Shelby, they changed the world. Every one of them with their distinct personalities, their own way, they changed the world. And I can think, again, as with, with Kim and I, with Kim and me, and our, our lives, our relationships. I remember when I was in uh, Houston, Texas, and, and I, was, I got saved, and I went to, uh, went to Bible college, and, and there was a lot of issues there. Everything was about faith. I just knew God had called me to preach. And it's never the same for two people. So if you hear me tell a story, please do this. I'm going to just put this qualifier in. You hear me tell a story just because you feel the same way doesn't mean that that's your call to preach. Don't let my call be your call. You let your call be your call. Or his call be your call. And I remember when I went to Bible college and I'm in that school and I was there for almost two years and I'm get to a certain point where it was, I just kept asking the teacher, the professor questions scripturally because I noticed that they would skip this scripture, skip that scripture, or they wouldn't spend any time on this one, and I wanted to know what it meant, and I would go to them. And Anyway, it was challenging and created some challenges. So I was called into the dean's office at my, co my Bible college, and I went in, you know, you've heard this, most of you have heard this story, and I was called into the dean's office. I go into the dean's office, and he said, Steve, I just don't think it's going to work out for you and me. I don't think this school is a good fit for you, and I don't think you're a good fit for this school. And I said, because, because I'm asking questions? He said, no, it's just you're, you're always asking questions. You're always, you're, because I believe questions are the pathway to revelation. And so I said, so what do I do? And he said, well, you know, there's some churches out there that are looking for youth pastors, and, and my suggestion to you is go be a youth pastor. I, first of all, now that I think back on that moment, I'm thinking, how many people have they sent to be youth pastors that they had given up on? <laughs> Maybe that church will do better with this guy or a girl. So I went out there, and I made a couple phone calls, and there was a church in Cordell, Georgia. I called them, said, hey, Steve Parker. School asked me to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Might you consider me to come and teach your youth? <laughs> anyway, they said, come on out and preach for us and see if you can pass the test, preaching test. And I drove over there full of faith and abandon. God, I know you've called me to this, and even if this particular denomination doesn't believe in me, you do. 
I know you do, and I know what you've called me to. And I'm not going to stop preaching because they don't like that I ask questions, because I'm always going to ask questions. And I got out there and I preached, and, and they said, come, be on staff, come be with us, a praise and worship leader. They didn't know what in the world they got. <laughs> Youth pastor. And I did. But I went to a place I didn't know, a place I'd never been, full of faith and abandon. Father, I trust you. I was paid $100 a week, $100 a week. Had to buy my own groceries, fill the car with gas. In fact, I didn't have money for a car, so they donated one to me. Somebody in the church donated a car to me. It was the first car I had when my wife and I met. It was a, station, it was a grocery getter. It was a full-size station wagon. It was about 38 feet long. No, mine was the old Chrysler. And they donated. They, here's a gift. I got $100 a week, paid $100 a week, cost me 200 to fill it up with gas. But I was full of faith and abandon. I said, you know what? Father, you called me and I said, I will, and I will. And you know what? This gas guzzling locomotive that I'm driving <laughs> with a headliner falling out, literally laying on my head. I get in the car and it's... And that was back in the days, you know, when, when I had a lot of hair. I actually had hair down my, between my shoulder blades and, and it was poofy. And then for a season I had an afro. And man, that thing did terrible things to my fro. I know y'all are picturing all this. I'm losing you now. I can't lose you. I can't lose you. We're at the important part of this. I took my wife on a first date. We went over one set of tracks and the muffler fell off. I'm in the middle of absolutely nowhere in the middle of the dark, dark of night, not middle of the night, dark of night. I was a gentleman. Dark of night. I'm out there with a coat hanger trying to tie the muffler up on the bottom of the car. <laughs> Sorry. I smell like grease. But I was full of faith and abandon. I said, you know what? You called me. And I don't care what in the world happens, what gets in my way. I am not quitting on you. My yes was a for real yes. My yes was a for real yes. It wasn't a fake yes. It wasn't a yes with consequences. It was, I mean, a yes with, with conditions. Thank you. It was a yes filled with a yes. Filled with a yes. Then when we were in Tennessee and we were, went down to Panama City and I knew that God was calling us there and I leaned over to my wife and I said, two weeks we will, in two weeks we'll live here. She was five months pregnant with my oldest daughter, Kaylee. Full of faith and abandon. I knew God called me. He said, will you come and sit at this, person, this preacher's feet and learn from him? I didn't even know. If I had known him before he said that, I would have said, no. <laughs> Some of you get that. But I didn't know him. And the father said, will you come and sit at his feet and will you learn how to honor me, how to serve me, how to serve the people that I'm going to send to you? Will you learn? And I said, I will. We walked out of that building. I looked over at my wife. I said, in two weeks, we'll live here. It took us three. But we moved there full of faith and abandon. Then when we went in there and he said, one of the requirements of him for anybody that was on staff at that church was that the wives could not work. I know. Ladies, you want to work? Work. I, some of y'all don't want to. I'm not even going there right now. That isn't what this message is about. But immediately in my mind, I'm thinking, we had two full-time salaries where we came from. We're coming here, and now you're paying me less than I was making by my, uh, on my own up there. There's no way we're going to make it. We're five months pregnant. We have this lot going on. We have no place to stay. But I never one time thought, let's get back in the car and go back to Tennessee. Because we were full of faith and abandon. We said, Father, I don't know, but you, you did this. And we said, I will. And it was a for real, I will. It wasn't a, an I will that maybe I will. Let me see what it's like first and then maybe I will. Let me test it out first and we'll see if I will. I remember going to a church in Rowlett, Texas that I was trying out for as a youth pastor when I 
when the church in Court Hill, Georgia folded. And I went to this church in Rowlett, Texas to try out for the youth pastor and they called me in there and after the service was over, I, I preached well, I guess, and because of what he said. And, he said, and I've, again, I've told this story a thousand times, but I'm sitting there at the table with this pastor of this church and he said, we love the way you preach and, and everybody loved the way you preach, so um, we want you to come and be the youth pastor at this church. And I looked him straight in the eye and everything about what he said just burned everything in me. And I said, if you want me to come because you like the way I preach, I ain't coming. If you didn't see more in me than that, it's not enough for me to come here. And I didn't. I got up and I took the gifts that he brought me and I walked out and got in my car. <laughs> if you don't see the anointing of God in me, if it only matters how I preached, but not instead of what I came with, I came with more than a 30-minute message. I have a one-hour one, too. <laughs> but we went to, we went to, and I'm going to tell you that, that I will to go to Panama City is why we can say I will at the Rock of Central Florida. That I will of Moses is why we can say I will. That I will of Paul is why we can say I will. That I will of Simon and Andrew is why you and I can say I will. Every one of those I wills, even though they came about from very different kinds of personalities, very different kinds of people, every one of those I wills did, had one thing in common. You know what they did? They changed the world. They changed the world with their I will. They changed the world. I'm going to tell you today, I don't know what your I will is, and I don't know what the Father's asking of you, but I'm going to tell you, you were born... You were, life was breathed into your lungs for one purpose, and that's so that you can change the world for the glory of God. So that you, you can change the world for the glory of God. There are people sitting under the sound of my voice. There's people listening to me. There's people watching online right now. And you're wondering, when am I, how can I respond? You don't know Christ. You've never received Christ. I'm going to tell you, you might change a piece of the world without Christ, but you will never change the world like you would with Christ. And I want to tell you, if you want to change it eternally, there's only one option, and that is to say to Christ, I will. I will. I repent, and I receive you, and I will. I want everybody in this room to stand with me, if you would, please, at this time. Father, I lift my voice over the people in this house. I lift my voice over the sons and the daughters. I lift my voice over those who love you. I lift my voice over those who aren't sure how they feel about you. I lift my voice over every person. And I know that under the sound of my voice in this congregation, in this body of believers today, in this, in this house where people are gathered, online where people are watching, I know that under the sound of my voice today, there are people, many, who love you with all their heart, soul, and mind, but there are others who have never said, I will, to Jesus Christ. They've never said, I will, to Jesus Christ and allowed Him to do something miraculous in their lives so that they then could be a witness and a testimony of the glory of God. And I ask that today you will stir the heart of each one of those. Help us today to be part of encouraging them, strengthening them, Helping them to walk out faith in you. If there's anybody in this room today or watching online today, specifically in this room, if you're in this room and you say, you know what, I've never said I will to Jesus Christ. I want you to get out from your seat and I hold your hand up, but I want you to get out from where you are and I want you to come and join me at the front. You've never said I will. Your I will has never been a real I will. It's been a fake I will, or it's been a quasi I will, or maybe I will, but it's never been a fully a full I will. I want you to get out from your seat, would you please? Get out from your seat and come. If you're watching online and your I will has never been one for Christ, I want you where you are right now, wherever you are, I want you online. I want you to listen to the voice, listen to my voice today because I'm going to pray with you and this congregation is going to pray with you. I'm believing for you, whether you're in this room or you're watching online. Is there anybody else in this room? today that will come and stand across the front of this building and, and say with me today, I want my I will to be a real I will. I don't want any more maybe I will, perhaps I will, should I? I want your I will to be I will to be a certain I will. Come and stand with me today. Come on. Stand with me today.